from the southern tip of Africa comes a voice of revival. A voice revealing God's truths and desires for our lives. A voice equipping saints with the practical application of God's Word. We've got to have a firm foundation and that's the Word of God. So have your Bibles, notepads and pens ready as we get into more practical application from God's Word. Now all that's required is for us to have an absolute trust in this Word. Let's join Alan Bagg for more wisdom for life. Good morning, dear friend. Welcome back to Wisdom for Life. My name is Alan Bagg, and it's so good to be with you again today. I'm excited about this week. This is a subject that is so important for so many Christians, for each and every Christian, in fact, but those that have not yet got into the fullness of it. You know, the Bible says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that my people, my people, not even those unsaved, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Think about that. Whenever we have problems, it's not really people think I have, you know, I have a financial problem. No, it's not a financial problem. It's a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Notice God didn't say my people are destroyed for a lack of finances or a lack of a good wife or a lack of a team or a lack of a business. No, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, praise God. That's why we have this program, so that we can get the Word of God to you. You come to know the truth. Jesus said, when you know the truth, and notice He said, that truth will make you free. Now, a lot of people say, oh, the truth will make you free. No, it's the truth that you know that makes you free. That's why Solomon said, you know, in all you're getting, get understanding. He spoke about wisdom being the principal thing. And in all you're getting, get understanding. So in these programs, that's what we're doing. We're wanting you to get a full understanding of who you are. And so often Christians can be saved, born again, headed for heaven, but are struggling now on this earth. And I'm telling you now, Jesus did not intend for you to live that way. Out of his own mouth, he said that he came that you might have life, and that you may have life abundantly. Now, if I'm not experiencing abundant life, something's fallen short because that's what Jesus paid for. I mean, think about this. He paid for your salvation. Yeah. Well, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You confess with your mouth that he's your Lord and Savior. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he's your Lord and Savior, you saved. I'm sure you don't doubt your salvation. That's settled. You are saved, headed for heaven. The word says that God never leaves you nor forsakes you. Well, that settles it. He is with you. Even if you don't feel it, even though our emotions may not always think it, but I know my God never leaves me nor forsakes me. The word of God says that he is love, that he loves you with the same love that he loves Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Now, the reason I'm saying all these things, these are scriptures that are manifesting. They're showing themselves true. So if there's a word that says you have this, and then you should be getting it. If there's another scripture that says you have it, then you need to see it in your life. Now, if Jesus said that he came that you may have life and have that life abundantly, well, then I want to see that abundant life in my life. If he paid the price for it, I want to see it manifesting. I'm sure the same is with you. You've believed Jesus. You've confessed him as your Lord and Savior. Therefore, we're about to see that abundant life manifest in your life. Remember Paul said in Romans chapter 15 verse 29, he says, I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Listen to the assurance of how he says that. He says, I know. I know when I come to you. Now, I mean, you know, a lot of people would think that's arrogant or, or presumptuous. No, no, no. Paul understood something about the gospel. And that is, if God has said something, that settles it. You know, when God speaks, he's not a man that he would lie. He says he watches over his word to perform it. That means if God has said something and he's the same yesterday, today and forever, the word of God also tells us that he's not a respecter of persons. If he did it for one, he did it for all. And so if he's done it once, he'll do it again. And so if God, these are things that Paul understood about God. That if God had promised a blessing, Paul was absolutely convinced. He didn't have to try and tell God what to do. 
See, that's very often where people misunderstand faith. Is I've heard people that have tried to criticize this particular type of teaching, and they say, you can't tell God what to do. Well, here's the thing. We're not telling God what to do. You're not telling God what to do. God's already told us what he's done. He's told us what he's already accomplished. And now he's saying it's yours. It's time to use it. It's, for example, if I invited you to a dinner at my home and Janine spent all day preparing, and I mean she prepares nicely. She really cooks really well. I'm a blessed man. And so she gets together this great meal and she, she's thinking about it and she does the necessary homework. She finds out what's your favorite meal and what's your favorite dessert. And she prepares it with you in mind and sets the table and puts all the place settings in place and uh, sets out the meal and we're getting ready to eat. And then you sit down and you look at the table and you say, um, Pastor Janine, would you mind if I ate this food? I know I don't deserve it. And I really, I haven't had something to eat all day long. I'm so hungry. Please, please, I'm begging you. If you could find it in your heart. If it's some way your will. If somehow you could manage it. Can I please ask if I may eat this food? I mean, <laughs> you know already that sounds ridiculous. I mean, that's why you're there. You've been invited. You don't ask for that permission. And you're not being presumptuous by eating it. Why? Because it was prepared with you in mind. You're welcome to go ahead and eat as much as you like until it's finished, in fact. And uh, even if you said, may I have some more? I'm not going to find that presumptuous. That, to me, would be a compliment for Janine. Go ahead. Eat as much as you like. And so uh, that's very much the reason I've said all of that is because that's exactly how God is. The Bible tells us in Psalm 23, David understood. He says, you prepared a table before me. In the presence of my enemies. God, you've, no matter what's come against me, you've already prepared my victory. You've already prepared my salvation. You've already prepared my deliverance, my provision. Now all I have to do is sit down and enjoy it. That's the same way with God. When Jesus paid the price, he paid the full price. He didn't do half a job. He completely freed you from all sin. All sin. All sin. All sin cleared you of the debt of sin. You are free from... In fact, the Bible says the very handwriting of that sin has been wiped away. God's erased it from His memory. He says, I remember your iniquities no more. And so as far as heaven is concerned, what Jesus did cleared you of all sin, of the guilt of that sin, of the unrighteousness. All you have to do is accept it and believe it and walk in it. So the moment you do that, that sin is completely removed. Jesus paid the full price. And then by paying that full price, He paid for your full healing. The Bible says, by His stripes you have been healed. He paid the full price for your provision. Even though He was poor, yet for your sakes, uh, even though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might be made rich. So He's paid for that. The Bible says He bore every pain. He suffered every persecution. So he's taken every oppression, anything to do with the soul realm, the mind, depression, all those things. He's removed. He's removed everything. In fact, the Bible says that he became a curse for us so that the blessing of Abraham may come upon us. I mean, a total curse. He became the curse. No matter what the curse can bring up against your life, Jesus absorbed that entire thing into his life, destroyed it, and then rose from the dead, proving that the curse was deal dealt with. And now the blessing of Abraham may come upon us. Now what blessing is that? That's the same blessing that God spoke over Noah, which is the same blessing he spoke over Abraham. Right there in the Garden of Eden, he spoke over Adam and said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill up the earth, subdue it, and take dominion. Adam was blessed. That blessing empowered him. And that's the blessing that God wanted to keep alive. That's why he spoke to, to Noah. If you just believe this blessing, it'll work for you. Well, as we know, history shows us that particular, those generations didn't keep with it. But when he found Abraham, he found a man who believed God. He found a man who would speak that word, would speak it with authority, speak it and, and teach his children about it. And then when God spoke that blessing, he released it into our lives. And now Bible, Paul tells us that 
if we would believe that same blessing, uh, if we are of the same faith, if we are of the descendants of Abraham, now the Bible says if you're in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And that same blessing comes upon you. And so you are blessed. You are blessed. That blessing has completely delivered you from sin. That blessing delivered you from poverty, from sickness, from oppression. That blessing is at work in your life and it's still fruitful. It still multiplies. It still fills the earth and it still subdues and takes dominion. Now, particularly, that's what I want to talk about. That dominion. That dominion is not over people because, I mean, when God spoke Adam, uh, mankind didn't yet exist. God gave him authority over the earth and everything that's created in the earth. So it's not over the human race. The human race unites in dominion over creation. But what's happened is when the devil got in and he stole that authority from Adam, Adam was given that full authority in the earth. And the devil took that authority by getting him to, to, to submit to a lie when he deceived Eve through that, uh, that, that, that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, here's the thing. He did not, uh, you know, sometimes people, uh, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying here. Uh, Eve, the Bible says, was deceived. The man was not. Now, that reference doesn't say it was Eve's fault. Okay? You go back to Genesis. In fact, let's go and have a look at that. I want you to see this, just so we can settle this once and for all. Uh, the woman was deceived. Now, deception is when someone says something to you, which could be a lie, but you don't see the lie in it. Okay? So, to you it sounds right and it sounds true. That's called deception. The thing with deception is you don't know it's deception. And you must remember, at this moment in time that the serpent shows up to Eve, she's never heard a lie in her life before. She only knew good. She knew God, and she knew her husband, Adam. And as far as she was concerned, uh, this is holy. This is beautiful. There's, <laughs> she had never known evil. She didn't know what a lie was. Have a look here. And so, chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Now, that's exactly how Satan starts with, with all of us. He'll come to you and tempt you. And he'll, you might have heard something on Sunday. Maybe you listened to a tape or a CD. And you'll come and say, Are you sure that's what God said? I, I know the preacher said that, but are you sure that's what God said? She is immediately sowing a seed of doubt. And then verse 2, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, hang on a moment. If you go back and look what God said, He didn't say they may not touch it. You must recognize for them to be able to tend those trees in the garden, they're going to need to touch it. What God did say is don't eat it. Now, uh, the next statement here, verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, Let me just say something else about what I just said there in verse 3. Often God will give us scripture. And I want to encourage you. God's word is strong enough to stand on its own. You don't have to invent other things to say. I've heard people, you know, they say, Yeah, God said, and, they, and you kind of hear them inflate the verse. And you go, that's not exactly what the verse is saying. It's close, but you've added a little extra trying to make your point. And we've got to be very cautious about that. Don't add to the word and don't subtract from it. If the word says something, you quote it. There is so much power in that word that you just have to speak what God said. It'll come to pass. The problem is when we start to misquote the word, that's exactly when the deception begins. And so Eve was saying something, yeah, trying to make a point, but that's where she digressed. Now the deception is beginning to set in. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. <laughs> isn't that exactly how the devil is he'll come to you and he'll say you know uh did is is this what the bible is this what you've been told god said uh well uh listen that's not really gonna happen you won't die i mean yeah you don't have to go to church all the time you won't die uh, if, if you stop tithing you're not gonna struggle i mean look at joe down the road he's not tithing he's got the motorboat he's got the four by four 
You're not going to die. Now listen, if God says the wages of sin is death, it's death. That settles it. You may not die today, but I'm telling you, it's just as sure as, as God made little apples, is that if He said something, if He says, if I don't tithe, then the curse is action in my life, then that's the case. I'm going to believe it and make sure that I tithe. If He says, don't neglect the gathering of the saints together, when there's a meeting, you're going to find me there. Why? Because God's word is true. He's not a man that he would lie. And so the devil will try and tell you, no, don't worry. You, uh, nothing will go wrong in your life. You won't die. And then he says in verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Hang on a moment. They already are created like God. Isn't that what he said in Genesis 1 verse 26 all the way through to 28? He said, let's make man in our image according to our likeness. Verse 27 says, And then God created man in his image. So they've been created in the image of God. Secondly, they've been created to know everything good. They know God. He is good. And I guarantee you, if Adam ever needed to know, and he sat down with God and said, God, you know, I just want you to tell me about this thing about evil. God would have taught him. He would have shown him what it means. So, uh, you see, there again, the devil will try and highlight what you don't have in your life. That's exactly how he tempts us. Think about it for a moment. you blessed. You have a home. You slept somewhere last night. You have food. Uh, you got clothes on. Uh, you, you know, you, you looked after. You, you're blessed. But what the devil does, he highlights what you don't have. He'll point out somewhere in your life where there seems to be a lack. Now, I've used the word seems because, remember, God has given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has given you every spiritual blessing. He has given you all things. I mean, <laughs> you have all grace abounding towards you. You always have all sufficiency in all things. So, we have everything in our lives. Now, I may not see it manifested in the natural yet, but it's already in my life as a seed. I just have to bring it out. But what the devil will do is he'll highlight what you seem to not have at this moment in the natural. Look at this. I mean, you don't yet have uh, uh, whatever he might name it. Something in your life. And then what he'll do is point to your neighbor and see, he's got it. Look at that Christian. He's got it. Now, you really, he's not as good a Christian as you are. I mean, you know, you, you go to church. He doesn't go that often. You sing in the choir. He hardly does anything in the church. You run a home cell. Uh, why hasn't God given it to you? Why has he not told you? I mean, there must be a reason. God must have a reason why he hasn't given it to you. Probably it's because, uh, you know, whatever it is. So that's exactly how he works. He'll bring up all kinds of confusion, pointing out what you don't have, and then try and tell you that you should have it, and really it's God keeping it away from you. Now, all of that's a lie, and you know it's a lie. That's how the deception got in Yeah, He says, God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And then he says in verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Now remember, uh, Paul tells us at this moment she's in deception. So you can't blame her for that. Okay, she's in a place of error. She's in deception, but watch this. And then she also gave to her husband, who was out somewhere else in the garden far, far away, and had no idea what just happened. <laughs> no, that's not what it says. It says she gave to her husband with her. And he, ate. he was right there. He was standing there next to her. The Bible says she was deceived. He was not. He was listening to that thing with his eyes wide open. And I mean, he obviously he liked the sound of what he was hearing and didn't deal with it. I'm telling you now, if at that moment... He stopped this thing as she was putting that to her mouth. He'd say, excuse me, you don't go one step further. I've just heard the lie. I've seen that lie come into, uh, and, and uh, we will settle this before God. Satan, get out of our garden in the name of the Lord God. And I, we, we just now take authority here, and we'll, we'll get this thing forgiven. Let's go before our Father right now and take an eve there and say, Lord, this is what's happened. Please, uh, we, we ask you to forgive us. We, we settle this thing. I tell you, this earth would have been a totally different place. Adam and Eve would still be alive and God would be walking amongst and just enjoying everybody, children of God, serving Him. I mean, think about that. That's what happened exactly at that moment. Now, Adam didn't do that. And someone says, 
Yeah, no, I mean, uh, how could you have done that? If I was there, that's exactly what I would have done. Hang on, hang on, hang on one moment. Miss, remember, these deceptions are still coming. Every single one of us have sinned and let Satan mess around in our garden. Every one of us. And so we can't, you know, that what happened to Adam is exactly what's still happening to the human race. But praise God, Jesus, God immediately prophesied that Jesus was coming to settle this debt for mankind, get back this blessing. The Bible says that Jesus came. He told us out of his own mouth, I've come to save that which was lost. Uh, John tells us he came to destroy the works of the devil. And so he, I'm going to show you this week, we're going to study out how Jesus came as a man, got that authority back as a man, and then placed that authority back in our hands. Once again, God has placed that same authority, that original blessing, to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, and take dominion, has now been placed back into the hands of you as the believer. Now, if you don't know it, and you're not aware of it, and you're not aware of the consequences. In other words, if Adam was warned up front, listen, the devil's coming. You stand in your authority. You've got full authority to run him off. If Adam had known that and had taken that to heart and put it into place, who knows what would have happened? And so, but today I don't want to ask that question anymore. Who knows what will happen? Because we have enough examples and testimonies in the Bible to know exactly what happens. And that's what I want to put in you this week. We're going to find out what that authority is, how you stand in that authority, how you exercise that authority, and how you walk in that authority so that that blessing can manifest in your life in its fullness. I mean, we're talking about blessing without measure so that you can see what God paid for, what Jesus paid for coming in your life. And no matter what the devil brings against you, no matter what Satan comes up with to try and steal it from you, he's going to try and invade your garden. And you can slap down your spiritual foot and say, this far and no further. You get out of my garden. You have no place. You have absolutely no place in my life. Yeah, I'm going to show you how to do that. You submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It is time. It is time for us as the church to take back our authority and as the church to rise up in authority in the kingdom of God. Now, I've got something else I want to share with you, and I'll see you right after this. If you have authority, things happen. God created you to reign in life. The moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you are restored as a son of God. Once you know it, you cannot imagine how you could have actually lived before without it. If you're tired of always getting the same results, or if you're unhappy about the way life is treating you, then this series of teaching will definitely change your life. Packed with revelation and practical teaching, the series will transform the way you think, shedding light on who you are in Christ, what you are capable of, as well as practical ways to help you have God's power working through you. To have this key to walking in the dominion you were called to, your authority as a believer is a powerful series. Accept and receive the authority that you already have as a believer. Get this series today and see your faith rise to new levels. Your life will never be the same when you understand your authority as a believer. You can start to live life successfully as a believer so that you can manifest the blessing in other people's lives. Get yours today and we'll have that with you in a few days time. Now my dear friend, if you've not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to ask you to do it today. While you're watching this program, wherever you are, I want you to know Jesus loves you. He died for you, He paid the price for you, He gave His life for you, and then rose from the dead proving that you're free from all sin. All you have to do is believe that in your heart. The Bible says if you confess it with your mouth, that He is your Lord and Savior, you'll be saved. And so I want to do that with you right now. While you're sitting watching this program, pray this prayer out loud with me. Say this together with me loud now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe with all my heart you rose from the dead and now today are seated at the right hand of the Father. I call you Lord. You're my Savior. And I know as I do this, I'm born again, a child of God, 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. My dear friend, that's the first time you prayed that. You're now born again. I've got some gifts for you. Yes, something that will explain to you what's happened in your life, as well as a Bible study program, and then also this great CD. That's my free gift to you. I'd like to sow that into your life free of charge. I'll even pay the postage. Please just write to me at that address or call us on that phone number. And once we have your details, I'll get that off to you and I'll be with you in a few days' time. Tomorrow we're going to carry on once again with this awesome subject. I look forward to being with you there. This is Alan Bagg reminding you that Jesus is Lord. And remember, life is a choice. Choose life. God bless you. Alan Bagg Ministries has made this week's Wisdom for Life programs available on CD and DVD. To order this week's programs, contact us at this number or these addresses and we'll send it to you as soon as we can.